I'd like to introduce on my left Nanita Desai, who is a leading UK composer. She started as a sound designer, and I thought that was a lovely segue, on numerous features, including Bertolucci's Little Buddha and Werner Herzog's Lessons of Darkness. And she's composed scores for hundreds of documentaries, which have garnered Oscar, Emma, Emmy, BAFTA awards. She's currently the BAFTA break, Breakthrough Brit and recently won a, a large award, the Music and Sound 2016 Award for Best Feature Film Score for the Confessions of Thomas Quick. Recent projects include the documentary Mumbai the Musical and the Hunting, Hunting the KGB Killers. So welcome, very, thank you so much for coming. And on my right, all the way from Switzerland, I would like you to meet and uh, welcome Balz Bachmann, who's a composer and musician. He was born in Zurich and st has studied many different um, disciplines. He studied at the Swiss Jazz School in Bern, and he's been writing music for both fiction and documentary motion pictures, theater, arts, and television. He's won many awards, um, the Film Music Prize and for Suiza Foundation, and his score for Little Girl Blue uh, was also an award winner, and he's been nominated twice for the Swiss Film Prize Quartz. He's also very much involved with uh, other film composers in Switzerland and internationally, so welcome to both of you. We're going to start with you, and we'll have a little, uh, and then uh, we're going to move to, to Balz, and then we're going to have a, a little Q and A between the two of us, uh, between the two of them, and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. So thank you so much. Okay, you know, thank you very much. Hello, everyone. Uh, I just want to say how humbled I am to follow on from Walter Murch. I don't, that's a really tough, um, tough act to follow, especially when he was such a hero of mine. Uh, when I was uh, growing up and trying to get into this industry. Um, so as, as Elizabeth said, I write music for mainly documentaries, uh, non-fiction, but recently I've been working in fiction as well. Uh, and so uh, that might be an interesting thing for us to discuss about non the differences between non-fiction and fiction. Um, but Today, I'd like to sort of act as a, as a case study, if you like, of a couple of projects that Elizabeth mentioned that I worked on recently um, because the processes were quite different to the way I normally approach uh, writing for documentary. Um, and uh, so this, this particular project is a documentary musical. It was a, a sort of a hybrid uh, genre um, strange genre, um, and normally I'm used to supporting, you know, I consider myself a storyteller as opposed to being a musician or a composer. I'm really a, I, I tell stories through through music, and, and the objective is to support the images, support the story. There's something that someone said um, that gets banded about a lot, that you shouldn't notice music. And, that <laughs> and in some respects, that's true. But on the other hand, I think sometimes, especially with contemporary film scoring now, you do notice music more and the importance and the value and the effect that it can have. And so I'm used to hiding behind voiceover and dialogue and storytelling and, and powerful images, especially with some sort of, I do a lot of political, uh, score a lot of political sensitive uh, documentaries as well. And um, the images and the stories are very powerful. You don't need to enhance that with powerful music. So you want to be quite subliminal and supportive. And this pro um, particular project that I scored, which was on at Sheffield Doc Fest last year, actually, um, I made me feel very vulnerable and exposed uh, because I had to lead, help lead the narrative, um, which was quite a daunting uh, process. So um, it's, um, it's called Mumbai High, the musical. That was a project for the BBC that was a, a feature doc as well, part of Storyville. And um, the, the story, if you like, is a, it's a documentary. It's about um, five or six children uh, living in the slums of Mumbai uh, in Dharavi. And it's about um, their hopes and dreams and aspirations. It's about the power of education and how 
um, education can help, you know, they, they want to study their way out of poverty. And um, each child that was chosen to be in this film was chosen not on their abilities to sing and dance. They were chosen on the strength of their stories, their individual personal stories. So um, they'd been filming for 10 weeks, uh, a lot of actuality, a lot, lot of interviews with the kids in this school. And they narrowed it down to five children. And um, the idea was for me to write songs that they would then perform to camera and um, sing and dance to. And they, they're not trained. Uh, they can't sing to save their lives. Um, they, they can't sing, they can't act, they can't dance. But what they do have is this genuine, um, they're bursting with enthusiasm. And that really hopefully sort of comes through and shows. So um, I had about three and a half weeks. In terms of process, I had about three and a half weeks to write a song for each child. So that meant writing the lyrics. So I got given a transcription of each uh, child's interview and uh, about a couple of minutes uh, worth of video footage uh, so that I could study their body language, study their turn of phrase. I was born and brought up in London, so I only speak English. And they speak in three or four different languages. So I had to cross that hurdle as well of um, being able to communicate with them and teach them how to sing uh, very, very quickly. So I wrote six songs uh, over three and a half weeks. One to, uh, and each song had to encapsulate the personality of each child. And um, uh, I flew out to India, went with the crew, so that was quite a treat uh, to, to work in the chaos and, and madness of uh, Mumbai. And um, uh, teach each child their song, record them, and then film on location and, and film them performing their songs. So we've got a clip, I think. So this, this song is um, about a little girl, her name is Mary, she's 15 years old and she lives in a tin shack on the side of a railway line and the school teacher in the school picked her up and said this child needs an education and she wants to, her dream is to be a footballer like David Beckham and, uh, and um, yeah, so let, let's have a look and listen. The, um, the running thread through that was water, because water is so important to the sustenance. Um, you know, they have to walk two miles a day to get running uh, to get fresh water. Um, the monsoon washes away her home every every uh, every year, and they have to rebuild their homes um, every year. They lose everything. So water is a vital it's sort of a, the giver and taker of life, really, for them. So I thought it was important to try and to integrate that into the song and um, and try and to maintain a sense of integrity, uh, which was incredibly important to not. I suppose if you're looking on the on the negative side of things, you could say that the children are manipulated. You're 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 you know you're telling that that's in telling that story, and it was really important to me and to the to the director to not do that to maintain authenticity. Um, it didn't matter that the children could whether the children could sing uh, or dance. You know, if they sang badly, I was paranoid about that. So technically, it was quite a challenge uh, trying to get them to sing in time and to learn. Um, and um, so that that was a very interesting project, which had its own set of challenges. Um, another project that I worked on, which is very, very different from this, uh, is a feature doc that was uh, here at Sheffield Doc Fest two years ago, I think. Um, it's a feature doc called The Confessions of Thomas Quick. Uh, I don't know if any of you remember that. Um, and, um, and I have a penchant for Nordic Noir. I met the director, Brian Hill, uh, a couple of years ago when he won the BFI Film Fund pitch here. And I approached him and said, I would love to work on your film. And um, because I felt a strong affinity to the, um, to the dark subject matter, which is about uh, Thomas Sturer, who's uh, a notoriously famous um, alleged serial killer. And I don't think I'd be giving the ending away by saying that he was put into a high security asylum for um, over a 23-year period, and over that period, 
uh, apparently he killed over 40 people, um, committing all sorts of horrific crimes. And so this, the, the film um, has the sensibility. The director wanted um, the score and the film to have a very Nordic noir feel yeah, with sort of bleached out blues and I'm very visually inspired. Um, I respond um, very uh, viscerally and emotionally to the images. If you put images in front of me, I'll go, yep, I know what to score here. It, it, it's a great communicator. Um, and so I um, uh, wanted to try and break the mold as well and try and bring in other musical influences. So the story focuses on Thomas Sturer, who is um, your, the director wanted me to um, not create, um, not make you feel emotionally empathic with the, um, with the character. You didn't want to send, you, he was meant to be portrayed as a monster in the first half of the film. And then slowly towards the end of the film, your feelings towards him um, are meant to become more ambivalent. And, and so the music had a big part to play in that, in that storytelling process and telling the audience how to feel emotionally. Could you see the clip? So let's just quickly watch yeah. the clip. Yeah. <laughs> so now, Vance, I want you to tell us a little bit about some of the projects you've worked on, and I, I understand you have some nice clips to show us too. <laughs> Thank you for inviting uh, me. I'm Okay. Um, as I brought with me some some examples um, of my work, and um, I thought it's maybe interesting to show um, the beginning of a project. Project so um, to show how how I work uh, um, on first ideas and draws and sketches. So. Um, I brought also an example of that, so this is, it's just the first first draft of it. So, because in this moment uh, of the process, it's it's a very fragile moment, uh, also for the director, um, because maybe a lot of things uh, went wrong or uh, or are not like they or he or she wanted it to be. So, um, uh, but if I could wish uh, uh, how to start in a, in a film, or best case uh, probably would be to, to read long before shooting um, the script and then uh, starting a conversation and um, to, to, to get the, uh, a lot of the story and the characters and um, also the vision of the director. So um, that helps a lot to, to, to create uh, my own image also and to propose things uh, musically. So uh, also I, I really love to, to compose on, on a script. That's for me, it's, it's a really um, lovely way to, to start with a project because it's, it's, it's completely um, free then from, from, from me. So it's, uh, I can start completely uh, also from my vision. So uh, that's a very uh, interesting technique for me. And uh, I had very good experiences also in doing that. But of course, it's, uh, it's the best case, I say. So uh, it's, it's really just if you have um, a, a director who comes long before shooting with the, uh, the script to, to me and, and I have the chance to do it uh, um, like that. So, um, and then I can start to, to make my drafts and, 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 and sketches and um, send it to, to the editing room. And uh, let me put it over here. And uh, that's maybe also a good, good thing to avoid temp music. That's, uh, a thing we maybe later on talk uh, together with mm -hmm. Anita uh, because it's a it's a interesting point. Ten uh, music, the bane of our lives. Exactly. So we'll, 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 that's a basically a good thing to avoid it. So um, uh, we we are talking later on. So next, uh, the first example I wanted sh uh, to show you is. Um, totally the opposite of, of best case. It's uh, 
um, the director came to me and, and, and um, uh, I had no chance to read the script. I had uh, no chance to be part of the editing process. Um, they gave me uh, the finished picture lock and uh, told me um, the mixing is in six days. So I had, to, I had six days for, to score the whole film. So that was quite a, a task to do, but um, I wanted to show it to you because it's also, we talked before about limiting things, and that was also a, 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 a limit for me to know I have six days, I don't have a recording session, a big one, most of the, the instrument I have to play by myself. It has to be very simple. Uh, maybe it has to be, if it works, a, 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 a motive, a live motive. Do you say a live motive yeah, in English? Motive. And uh, I just had to try out things. So um, uh, it's number seven to uh, show it. And it's a film uh, from uh, Sophie Heldman, a German uh, director. And uh, it's the, what I showed to you is just the first, very first draw I did and showed uh, to her. I tried to, to work uh, with a simple piano, very simple piano theme. And um, the story is about um, a couple and he gets cancer, and uh, finally uh, they decide to to make suicide. And um, it's it's uh, it was the the scene I want to show is it's just um, without no dialogue, nothing. So it means it has to 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 tell somehow a part uh, of the story. So uh, what what for me what 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 was very nice is to to pick this scene because it, for me, uh, just the, the picture um, sounded for me. I just immediately hear it something and, and maybe that was the point that I, I came very uh, f uh, fast to, to this result. So hopefully the sound is there. Which was a good thing since you only had six days. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe then we can go to a, a, a complete uh, different uh, film. Uh, it's a fictional uh, documentary. Uh, it's called Days Done by Thomas Imbach. He stands filming out of the window of his studio. So and per periodically we are here uh, people um, uh, leaving messages to his answering machine. and. Uh, Actually, the story uh, is told um, with those messages from the, the answering machines. Um, they congratulate him, they, his father dies, it, his child is, is, is born, and we hear uh, all those stories over those uh, answering messages. messages. And um, the, the music had to be a, a kind of be part of the storytelling. So uh, we decided to have um, songs with lyrics and uh, about 12 songs. Uh, um, and we took some existing songs uh, and uh, we wrote uh, a part of songs. And then beside that, there was um, a kind of soundscape, a score, which take place as the inner voice of the missing protagonist. So uh, um, this is maybe we look first at number three. There was a song by Bob Dylan, by the way. So <laughs> we had the two days to record uh, all the songs and um, a bit more for, for the score. Uh, then um, it was planned to record um, uh, the voice uh, as kind of inner voice with a, a German act uh, actor. It's called uh, Milan Peschel. But uh, just right the, the evening before the recordings, he went sick, so we had to, 
to uh, uh, find uh, another person who sings all, all, all those songs and that, that was quite uh, stressful, uh, stressful. <laughs> uh, but um, a good friend of mine uh, uh, did that very well, so uh, we were uh, very happy. So maybe I jump to another, uh, I mean I could yeah. maybe uh, show uh, more scenes of this movie, but there is another film uh, I brought with me. Um, it's called uh, Yolam's Cure. It's uh, by a director, uh, Sabine Giesiger. It's about um, Irving D. Yolam. Uh, it's a psychiatrist, an American. Um, and uh, we travel with him uh, through, uh, we make an existential journey through, uh, through the human mind somehow. Um, and. Um, the director wishes uh, that the picture and the music should stand as a as a counterpart to to the intellectual uh, thoughts of of uh, of, of what is uh, telling. So, besides, uh, she wanted to make the audience audience kind of dive into a, uh, a journey to to create an experience uh, similar to a, a therapy session. So. Um, Maybe we can uh, see uh, number four. I'm going to open it up to both of our panelists to ask a few questions because there's a few things that I think is, comes up working with a post-production crew and that's always the language or the communication and the feedback between a director and a composer and sometimes the, the challenges that that poses to directors who maybe have an idea in their head, but how do you communicate that to the, um, to the composer? So maybe you could speak a little bit about that and some of the, um, how you get around that where perhaps a person's language is not as fluent and in bringing out the best score from you. Well, I think, um, I think really asking a director to talk about music is, um, is like dancing about architecture. <laughs> you, know, you can't, uh, I mean, I, I, as a composer, I don't expect a director to talk to me, a filmmaker to talk to me in terms of musical language. I don't expect that. Why should I? That's not their strength. That's, that's mm -hmm. the composer's strength. So really, the most important thing is to communicate in terms of um, the emotions and the stories and the intent of the of the scene and the intention of the film and it's our job to encapsulate that and, and distill the the script and the uh, and the intent of the directors you know in terms of storytelling in, into the music isn't it yeah um, yeah uh, and and one of the things i mean there's so many different ways of communicating um and i think we have to be flexible uh and work to the personalities of the directors as well um, so, uh, sometimes a great intermediary is the use of music, other music, as a, as a starting point, as a talking point. And so is that the temp track? Can be the temp track, yes. Mm. I mean, well, what I do is I create um, the equivalent of a, a musical storyboard. I create mood boards of music and then I'll present them to the director and say, what do you like, what do you not like? It's what, what, you, what they say when they tell you what they don't like is as important as, as what they do like. Yeah. You say? yeah, well, I think it's important to just get... Um, the more information I have, the better I can shape a picture of, of mm. what, 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 what this story needs. Or, and and um, of course, it's also, uh, if I worked already with a director it's 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 much easier because right. you the more i work with someone the, the closer or the faster we be coming to the, the the right direction but um as you say it, it's 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 really hard to to talk uh, about music with the director actually i i, I would say it's 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 better to talk on, on all all the other things than, mm. than music mm. um, because it's it's really it's it's I think for for everyone it's hard to to describe the emotions of a musical piece so um, it's it's so good to 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 stay with the story mm. the characters it's so subjective mm. has your, the approach to scoring changed very much for you in the past decade would you say. Um, 
I think, I, I think the technology has um, really changed things, hasn't it, for us? Uh, because, I mean, there are, there are obviously there are advantages and disadvantages, but because everything is digital now, um, it means that the workflow, is, workflow can be a lot faster and uh, we never reach picture lock. I mean, I finished a film uh, three days ago and it's showing in Sheffield tonight. Uh, in showroom Cinema One, I think it's 8.30 uh, to catch a killer. And uh, that was written in, uh, scored in three weeks, so slower than, I'm um, much slower than you. You scored five, in five days, didn't you? But, um, but, you know, um, but technology, yeah, I mean, totally has changed, changed a lot. Totally changed, I think. Uh, yeah, uh, because also uh, directors and everybody in, uh, involved are, are used to, you can change till the last moment things. Mm -hmm. But um, I personally think it doesn't uh, lead to a better result because you can change uh, uh, all the time. Um, it's maybe, I, I think it's similar to if I compare it to recording uh, like we did in the past with tape machines. I think as a performer, as a music performer, you're, you're completely um, have a different concentration on, on that moment if you know there this light, this button is right now and you're <laughs> playing just right now and mm. you can't do it um, yeah. more and more yeah. over. And, and, and you also can sometimes, I, I think, it's, you can overdo. Yeah, Can having and, yeah, having options, having so many options. I mean, when you edit digitally now with the Avid, um, as opposed to, I mean, I started as a sound designer just when digital machines were coming in with Pro Tools, and um, and having those hundreds of options available to you all the time is actually detrimental. You know, you should res restrict yourself. And I mean, one thing I learned um, working with uh, Peter Gabriel was that. It's all about capturing the magic of performance. So when I bring in a musician, I cast, I audition my musicians very carefully so that I'm not spending hours working on the same thing, just as you would when you're auditioning your actors and when you're filming with, your, with actors or contributors. Well, that's, that's different in documentary, slightly different. But um, I mean, unlike Steven Soderbergh, who, because uh, he was pioneering the use of uh, the red, camera so he discovered digital and he was filming his actors I mean he's notorious for what doing 43 takes with uh, with the same actor until the performance is sucked dry out of the actor and then he goes that's the one that's it you know when they're sort of dead you know out of, when the performance is out of them and I disagree I think if if an actor if a musician can't do it within three takes uh, to capture that magic, then then you've lost it. It's like that bell curve, the peak of performance, and then coming down. So I mm -hmm. think having technology is great, but it's also detrimental to. Is the result better? I don't think so. Yeah. Now both of you work in both fiction and nonfiction. Um, what would you say is the biggest difference between scoring a nonfiction film and a fiction film? Actually, I am. I, um not thinking about that if I'm working on a film. For, so, for, so for me, it's uh, it's actually I don't know what's the difference. But of course, there are uh, many many different ways because of composing to un under a dialogue is it's complete, completely different than to uh, in feature films or maybe in feature films uh, in in fictional films you you uh, work more with leading melodies and and things but at the end I don't try to think about uh, a difference it's like I don't try to, to, to I don't think about the difference between uh, television and, and and feature of the theaters because it's just it's the story uh, mm. what counts but of course also there are budget things and 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 production uh, things that are uh, are different, but I try to not think. I mean, about documentaries it. always have a much higher budget, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think. I mean, the, the funny enough, that clip of Thomas Quick, the director wanted something that was more. He used the word cinematic. You know, mm -hmm. he wanted something with a big, expansive feel and and, mm. and give that sort of broad sense of emotion and dynamics because documentaries can be quite intimate, right? Um, depending on the and genre. Enclosed. Yeah. 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 
Um, to go back to the point we talked about in your um, presentation, um, about, about the um, temp track love. Because <laughs> uh, I know this is something that comes up time and time again whenever I, I talk to um, directors and editors, and, and I also do music clearances, so sometimes they say, well, we've fallen in love with something we've downloaded, downloaded from iTunes, and then it's, but you can't afford it. So what would be your answers to um, breaking up with your love affair with temp music? I think one of the most important things is to bring a composer on as early as possible onto a project. And then, uh, and when I've been fortunate enough, I mean, my work is split into uh, sort of 50-50. Sometimes I'm brought in right at the last moment, uh, even uh, having films at picture lock, you know, and they've laid in all this temp, temp music, and your job is to copy Hans Zimmer, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> who spent, you know, a year working on a score, spending hundreds of thousands of pounds, and you say, can I have it by tomorrow morning, please? <laughs> Which quite often happens. And, uh, and so you're put, you know, it's like writing with a gun to your head. <laughs> and then, uh, so bring your composer in early, because every, ultimately, you know, when you have temp music, um, and, and a director invariably says, you know, I like this, can I have something like that? The question you have to ask the filmmaker is, don't you want something unique for your film? Don't you want something bespoke? And that's the, that's the joy of bringing a bespoke composer to, mm -hmm. to a film. So um, if, when I get brought in early, I, um, I write the temp music. You know, I'll write lots of sketches and ideas and, uh, and then they will edit with those ideas. I think you, you do the same, don't exactly. you? Exactly. I mean, that's, that's why I like to, to start very early in the process. But um, it just somehow it glues to the film sometimes. Mm. If you put something there and, and you edit for weeks on, on, on this scene, you can't change it afterwards. So, so I try to, I mean, I have worked with many directors they say we don't want to work with temp music because of the editing you know it's also an interesting fact so because they said um, I can't really see the, the rhythm of the of the edit if I put some music mm. on the on the raw edit and I think that's it's really true but of course if you have to show your film uh, to commissioner or whatever it's 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 lovely to have music there but i think also the best thing is just to to give uh music to um to the editing room as early as possible mm. or when they start with your music and if there is a temp music i think it's good to just um listen to it and then but don't put it on on on, on the edit so if you li i mean uh the, the film Yalom's Cure, she had an idea of, of uh, Edward Grieg uh, a piece um, that was really beautiful and she, she put it into the film every, I don't know, <laughs> every five minutes or so <laughs> and it was so terrible to look and I was happy that she realized we have to put it out because it was, it was just it sounded really uh, mm. it wasn't ridiculous, working. right? Yeah. And mm. then we just put it away. We just had this echo of this emotion of this uh, of the, of this piece, and that was quite okay. So I think if you just listen to it and then put it away, it's quite okay. So you, it's yeah. like you said, you you, you 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 prepare a playlist. Yeah, right? I do. I create a mood board. Mm. I mean, I work uh, in natural history. Um, a fair amount as well, and the and the joy of that is you get brought in very very early on, and so I've just got a little clip to play sure. yeah, because it's it. 40 seconds long. But but the uh, I'm in the early stages of that project at the moment, and it's um, it's a landmark BBC series that follows on from a series they made called Human Planet. I don't know if you remember it, yeah. and this is a kind of a follow-on from that. It's called Rituals, and it's about human rituals, contemporary rituals, traditional rituals. It's all about the connection between human beings, about people, really, at heart. And so the brief on that, they, they spend a year filming all around the world, um, uh, and so I've got 
seven or eight months to work, work on that four-part series. So what they did was they sent me um, a, a kind of a, 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 a promo that they made, which was about 40 seconds long, to help sell the program. And they wanted me to score that. And they laid on this temp track uh, a contemporary piece of music called by a rag and bone man called Human, which is very apt but at the same time totally inappropriate. And so my job was to write, well, they don't want something contemporary, really. Uh, they want something that's classic and timeless, and also thinking about the essence of, try to create a brief for yourself and a set of parameters. We thought, wouldn't it be great to write with the human voice, uh, to create, use, because the human voice is something that you hear universally in all sorts of rituals, and to bring people together. So, um, so this is they gave me some footage, and I actually uh, edited the footage. So I wrote a piece of music and edited the footage around the piece of music. Hmm. So, um, so I also have to be a dab hand at Final Cut Pro as well, <laughs> and um, and this helped sell the uh, sell the series and and sold them onto the concept of the, uh, the musical concept of um, the approach that I thought that uh, I would take for the series. So this is clip number uh, four, please. Thank so you. So talking about technology, yes. that took a day to do. Yeah. A day that took to a day do. to write. Yeah. 40 seconds. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. I want to make sure we have time for some questions. Um, it's a great opportunity for you to ask any questions you have about scoring and about the art of scoring. So do we, uh, we have microphones, I think. At the, yes, there's someone here in the front row. <laughs> Thank you. Here we go. One of our masterclass students. <laughs> Thank you for a really interesting and fascinating, it's very important actually, it's something we're thinking about, or at least I am, with my new project. So how does one go about hiring somebody like you or you? You're so busy, you've never considered something like my project, but I'm just saying, how does one go about hiring? Speak to my agent. <laughs> <laughs> how, how does one go about finding a composer? <laughs> How does one go about finding a composer? Um, it, it's uh, it's a strange one, isn't it? Was, uh, I think. Um, I think film, film schools. To find a composer, I think it's the best thing you just. Um, um, if you listen to a music score, you hear it and you're fascinated about it. Probably the, that's the best way to find someone, and then I think just to ask. Uh, doesn't matter if someone is busy or not busy. I mean, if, if, if I, for me as a composer, if I think your project uh, is really interesting, I'm with you anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I think that there are various criteria to choosing the right composer. I think you need, you, you have a lot of uh, musicians and composers out there um, who have their own sound you know, that they've crafted their, their skill set. Um, but I think media composers tend to be very versatile, you'd be surprised. Um, but I think ultimately the personality is important. You have to have someone who's flexible and easy to get along with. Um, that's so, and, and collaboration, collaborative. Mm -hmm. You know, being collaborative is really crucial. Uh, um, yeah, uh, it's, that's, uh, that's uh, how, how can I say, it's, it's like, uh, yesterday I had a talk to a director, um, Akio, who, who was mm -hmm. on stage, and he, he was telling me it, it was so kind of a, uh, a hard process, process for his film. And the uh, uh, first thing I was asking him was it, uh, he said it's a wonderful uh, musician, a brilliant musician and, and, and composer, but I was asking him, did he uh, score before a film? And he was like, not, not much or not, not really. So I think it's, it's really different. The, 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 the work of to compose for, for films is really different from, from composing to, uh, to other... Um, also not having, not having an ego. Yeah. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because, because when you are writing music, you give a little piece of your soul away. 
and uh, you're giving a part of yourself and it's funny when I'm writing at three o'clock in the morning and it's not working and I think I have a deadline and you see you submit a piece and you go uh, and it's not a hundred percent there and you submit it to the director and it shows and you go well there's yeah it's a good piece but there's something not quite right about it and I thought god you know it was <laughs> three in the morning you know and and and, and so um, you have to be prepared to do changes and you, you know, exactly. uh, uh, all the time exactly. and, and to be humble because ultimately you're serving the film you're not serving your ego yeah. um, I think that that's the main difference between being an artist and being a personality than, mm -hmm. and being a film composer yeah you can write the, the nicest piece you ever written uh, yeah. but if it's not working with the story or if it uh, keeps you away from, from, from the scene it's not working, mm -hmm. and you have to accept that, or you have to accept that you maybe have to change. And mm. Well, thank you both very much. I really appreciate you taking the time to come out of very busy careers, and um, a big round of applause. Thank you.